I want to be able to share with you this morning as the world would be celebrating in a sense or remembering in a sense this Easter weekend. Now, today is uh, Sunday and um, really when we think about the fact that uh, generally there will be many outreaching uh, experiences of people sharing the good news, inviting friends and family to a Resurrection Sunday uh, on this Easter weekend. Unfortunately, many places, right, we'll be celebrating this Resurrection Sunday on a separate, different, separately different tone. This Sunday, as we think about this big event, that is one of the foundation stones of Christianity. I entitled my message this morning, The Empty Tomb, The Lingering Doubt. You know, one of the most important weeks in the Christian faith. But at the same time, I want us to consider this. Here is a follower of Jesus while he was on earth and was counted as one of the twelve on the news of the resurrection of Jesus, he did not believe straight away. He had his doubts. A disciple often misconstrued by his actions. I wonder, what did the resurrection do to him? Who is this? Meet Thomas, commonly known as. Well, in the Bible, you will know him as the twin. As I read other passages of Scripture, I would consider that he was also the brave. Yet, unfortunately, many of us would remember him as the doubter. Someone who doubts. And, and more appropriately so, because we read it from Scripture, and especially in a very eventful passage of Scripture found in John chapter 20. And I want us to read this together. John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29, that will be our text where we will be considering this man who was one of the twelve, yet at the same time, having followed Jesus so closely at his resurrection, he had his doubts. And we meet him at a time when Jesus was going to reappear again. Verse 24 says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my finger where the nails are, and put my hand onto his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my sight. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we consider the resurrection, the evidence of the empty tomb, and yet at the same time wrestle with the lingering doubts that Thomas had. Lord, teach us from your word this morning as we consider how Thomas processed those doubts and how you proved yourself to him. Let us, Lord God, have ears that will hear and hearts that will respond to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Now, this passage of Scripture is very interesting. When we think about this man, Thomas, who is Thomas? I want to bring to you three references. The first, of course, 
is that he was named as one of the twelve, and that you can find in Matthew chapter 10, verse 3, as well as Mark chapter 3, verse 18. Secondly, we would see that he was made mention of because he was going to Lazarus at Bethany. And that will be found in John chapter 11. And thirdly, we also will discover that he was again quoted during a time one day before the actual crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Named as one of the twelve. Thomas is his uh, Aramaic name. And at the same time, in the Greek, he's called Didymus, referred to as the twin. Very interesting because, uh, you know, of the 12 disciples, right, uh, every time his, the names were given, right, they would often give a description. And, uh, you know, when I thought about Thomas, I thought about, hmm, I wonder who his twin is, right? Who the other twin was? Because um, no one actually mentioned who uh, Thomas's twin, whether it was a twin brother, twin sister. So I guess, well, we don't want to speculate into who the other twin is. But more importantly, we want to be able to look at this person at a time when he had been following Jesus. Now, there had been a number of occasions where, you know, in the recording of the Gospels, we see that um, that such specific events were actually mentioned, specific individuals' names were actually being raised. And so from, from uh, discovering or from reading Scripture, sometimes we are able to get a glimpse uh, of a little bit about uh, what this person was like. And sometimes the writer gives us a little bit of a hint, but doesn't go more than that. So secondly, when we see in the book of John chapter 11, right, there was Jesus going to Lazarus at Bethany. And, uh, you know, Lazarus uh, was with the family of Mary and uh, Martha. And they were very, very close family friends of Jesus, right? And uh, many times when we have read the Gospels, we have seen that Jesus had spent time in this household of uh, Mary and Martha and uh, his good friend called Lazarus. And so in John chapter 11 was a time when the group of disciples was with Jesus a little bit further away from this place. And, um, and they heard, right? And they heard the news that uh, Jesus uh, heard from, uh, from uh, the news that um, Lazarus was sick. And uh, Jesus received that news. And the Bible says that he, he delayed a couple of days before he actually started to move. And as he was going to go uh, to uh, Lazarus, right, uh, what happened was uh, that uh, someone said, oh, uh, he already died. And then, you know, Jesus says, oh, no, we still go with him. I'll go to him. And this was the remark that Thomas made. And, and initially, when I read this, I, I said, why, why, why uh, would Thomas mention something like that? Thomas, in verse 16 of John chapter 11, in the New Living Translation says, Thomas nicknamed the twin, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. I was thinking, eh, why would he mention something like that? And going in back into the research of a little bit about why Thomas would mention something like that is because of the fact that, you know, Jesus uh, had an experience in Bethany and uh, near Bethany where the, uh, the, the, the religious leaders had actually tried to stone him. So if, if uh, you know, Jesus now deciding to go back to that area would probably face the kind of uh, the, 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 the threat, you know, of being uh, stoned. And so if, there's a, if you face a threat of being stoned, that means you face a threat of dying. And maybe that is the reason why Thomas says, let's go too and die with him. In fact, when I thought about it and I, I, and I, I, and I thought a little bit deeper, you know, it, it's not so easy for someone to say, you know, let's go and die with that person. I mean, they have been following Jesus for quite a while already, okay? And, and 
here, when that particular statement and reading into the context of which it was made, I thought that the statement that Thomas made was a very brave one. Indeed, it's a very courageous. It, it, it gives us that, that, that point that as if, you know, it's going to be very sacrificial. You know, hey, I, I, I walk with you, even if you die also, I'll die with you. You know, that kind of commitment. And so this gives us another picture, another uh, aspect of the way that Scripture talks about Thomas. To me, right, to be able to say those words is truly a man that is very, very brave. So this could be the second characteristics that we can see about Thomas. Thirdly, on the day before the crucifixion, which is John chapter 14, now this one, this is a very, a very passage of scripture that many of us know uh, that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life because he was in answering to this particular statement that Thomas made. And, you know, as sometimes we look at this passage of scripture and we look at it from different, different angles. However, as I was studying, to understand the, the man called Thomas, to see, A, hey, you know, he was listening to Jesus with great intent just before he asked this question. Because Jesus was talking about how he was going to a place where, where the, the disciples will not be able to go yet. And he's going to go and prepare a place for them. And so I'm sure as the disciples were listening, many of them had questions in our mind. You know, sometimes when we listen to people talk, you know, I remember in university when we were listening to lecturers, you know, sometimes the statements they make make you think, make you wonder, make you, sometimes baffles you. And I suppose it's quite different in a case of a lecture theatre and what we call tutorials. When we in university, when we had tutorials time, we actually had a closer interaction with, uh, with, uh, with the one who's running the tutorial. And so as we do that, right, we were able to ask questions. And I'm sure because the disciples were many, and of course there were the 12, but then there were many others who were following Jesus. And so as, as they were listening, Thomas asked this question, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And so you see, brothers and sisters, it, it, it goes to show that this man was, doesn't easily accept what was spoken. I think he had an inquisitive mind. He questioned whatever is being spoken to him. He's an independent thinker. And when no one dares to speak up or ask, he'd be the one who says, hey, I, 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 excuse me, I want to ask this question. You know, sometimes it's like that. Isn't it? Many of us have the question in our mind, but nobody dare to put up our hand and ask. Well, Thomas is a guy who dares. And even sometimes we laugh at it. But you know, brothers and sisters, when we read the Bible, it is good to have that inquisitive mind. It is good to have that independent thinking. Because when we see things, it will come from a different angle. So therefore, this man called Thomas was indeed someone who was not just, uh, you know, go with the flow kind of a person. But he would really, really be in thinking in his mind. So you see, brothers and sisters, the stage is set. Thomas is coming to a point where he's going to be faced with a crisis of belief. So, you see, as we read in John chapter 20, the stage is set now. Thomas is now the main 
main actor, of course, the, 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 the primary focus is Jesus Christ because Jesus appeared to his disciples. But you know, in John chapter 20, the passage that we read, actually the focus, the main actor, the main person was actually Thomas. Why? Because he had a crisis there that as he struggled through, his faith was won over because of this personal struggle. He couldn't easily accept what was going on at that time. And that is why we want to consider this stage, this crisis of belief, if you like. Because we see, brothers and sisters, initially none of the disciples believed at first. Isn't it? I mean, why? Because the crucifixion of Jesus was real. Many of them, even though they were afraid, from afar, they saw. They saw the cross being hoisted up. And they saw the one that they've been following for three and a half years hanging on that cross. So to them, the crucifixion was real. And of course, in Scripture, we read that one of the youngest one, one of the youngest disciples, that is John, was very close at the scene. So they had seen the crucifixion of Jesus. Secondly, we also know that the burial of Jesus in the tomb was an event that was witnessed by many. They took him down, the body of the Lord whom we love. And they prepared his body to be put into the tomb. They were there. They had seen the crucifixion. They had seen the burial of Jesus. And on the morning of the resurrection, and as the women first on the scene, bringing the, 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 the herbs, to, to embalm the body, they went to the tomb. And on their arrival, to their amazement, that tomb was open. They walked in and they saw just a white cloth. The empty tomb. And we know, brothers and sisters, at such a time as that, there's an amazing sequence of events that occurred one after another in quick succession. Because as the women saw the empty tomb, they rushed, they rushed back to where the disciples were hiding in fear. And they reported that he's not there. You know, no one could believe what the women were saying. And of course, the Bible does record a couple of them ran to the place where it's supposed to be, the tomb of Jesus. Questions remain. Where is, where is the body? Some of them want to remember, want to believe what was brought to their memory, that Jesus said that he will rise again. But, you know, they just had an experience like that of seeing the crucifixion. They have been participating in the burial of Jesus and putting him into the tomb. Confusion. And yet, while the disciples didn't want to believe, Jesus appeared to them. John chapter 20, verse 19, that Sunday evening, the first day of the week, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus appeared standing there among them and he said, Shalom, peace be with you. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds on his hands and his side and they were filled with joy when they saw. So the disciples, the the disciples that have followed closely to Jesus, they believe now. They have seen him. But Thomas was not there. What, 
what, what do you mean Thomas was not there? In fact, as we read that portion of scripture earlier on, it said specifically that the one that would not easily accept whatever has been tell, uh, told to him, he was not there. And so, brothers and sisters, this crisis of belief, I, be, I, I, I'm very sure that sometimes all of us need to go through as well. Three things. He has his doubts, but he was not a skeptic. You see, you know, some of us are skeptical. Some of us have a, 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 a we are very hard line. We are hardline rationalists. Don't believe and won't believe. But Thomas was not like that. He wants to, but he can't because the doubts are there. I can't believe until I see. Secondly, I, I, I believe that he had a broken heart from a damaged hope. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs, at hope deferred makes the heart sick. A hope that you have is now delayed in coming. It makes your heart sick. That damaged hope caused him disappointment. That is why he was not unwilling to believe but he was unable to believe. You see, there's too much negativity. And sometimes in life, when we have faced one disappointment after another, after another, after another, we dare not believe. And some of us are in such a situation like Thomas. You want to, but sometimes it's, I'm not able to. Jesus came the second time and he went straight to Thomas. Exactly at what Thomas said, that unless I see and feel his hands and I touch his side, Jesus said to him, here, Put your finger here. See my hand. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Now stop doubting and believe. Thomas was in awe. I believe that this statement was made to us to help us to realize that God, Jesus whom you and I love, whom you and I serve, is very personal. When we have an individual doubt like that, and sometimes we dare not express it because we are afraid people will laugh at us, yet Jesus knows. It's okay. It's okay to have that lingering doubt. But we must come face to face with it. Jesus looked at Thomas and said, Stop doubting. That lingering doubt must be put to rest. Become decisive. And that is why Thomas exclaimed, My Lord, my God. Interestingly, when Jesus invited Thomas to see for himself, he, from a strong doubter, <laughs> becomes a firm believer. You know, in those days, for the, the, uh, for the disciples that, 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 that went on to fulfill the Great Commission, Thomas, most of the people, we, we should, or most of the stories we read in the Bible, talks about the gospel going towards Asia Minor. But Thomas was the one of those who brought it towards India. And Thomas is very, very well known 
among uh, Christian circles in India because a strong doubter became a firm believer and brought the gospel to the continent of India. But at the same time, brothers and sisters, in verse 29 of John chapter 20, Jesus spoke these words, the second part of which I want to highlight. Jesus spoke to Thomas. He says, because you have seen me, you have believed. So some of us like that. Lah. Seeing is believing. Ma. Correct? Nothing wrong with that. But the second part of this portion of scripture says, blessed are those who have not yet seen, but yet have believed. Now, brothers and sisters, that's where you and you and you and you and I are in that category. We have not yet seen. And for those who believe because they have not yet seen, while well, they have not yet seen, they believe, we are the recipient of bigger blessings to come. And such is the position that you and I are recipients of blessings from God because we believe before we see. So in conclusion, on this Easter service, now many of us may have doubts and doubts may keep us from believing. But this morning, as we have considered Thomas, a brave man, a probably an intellectual man, because he's a thinking person. He moved from doubts and turned towards decisiveness. Once he's experienced, he becomes a firm believer. Those of you who are watching, and maybe sometimes you still wallow in that lingering doubt, Today is a day that your doubts must be turned to decisiveness. Let us pray. Father, this day that we remember the resurrection where the world celebrates Easter Sunday, we know that, Lord, it is a time where the evidence of your resurrection show that you have conquered death. You have conquered sin and death. And God, we know that you have done that as you are victorious. And you have given us this life. Without a doubt, O oh God, we want to receive this life. Without a doubt, O oh God, we want to decide that we will open our hearts and let Lord God you come and reign. Father, for those who are watching this morning, I pray, O oh God, that once they have made this decision, that they will get in touch with a good church and get involved in growing, in understanding you as the Heavenly Father who loves them. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and we we'll see you again next time.